All right. Uh, welcome to the sixth webinar of the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture Working Groups Learning Series. Uh, this is the first non-commodity-based session or a cross-cutting session for this learning series. Uh, before we start with this session, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are announcing yet again that if you have donation drives for the victims of calamities, uh, especially Typhoon Rolly and Ulysses or with the international name Goni and Vamco, respectively, just email us and we will help you reach wider audience to get as much uh, donations. Uh, before I officially start, uh, my name is BJ, the Communications Manager of PPSA, and I will be your host for this afternoon's session. Uh, before we proceed, uh, let me share our webinar rules. Okay, uh, we are recording this webinar, but rest assured that we'll take out the last part, which is the open forum once we publish the recorded webinar on PPSA's YouTube and Spotify accounts. Um, your mic is automatically on mute, but we will give you permission to speak once we get into the moderated part of the webinar. And should you have questions during the presentations, kindly type them in the Q&A box for better tracking of the questions. And of course, we will accommodate as many questions as we can uh, during the moderated discussion while considering our time allotments for each section. And if you have technical issues, you can use the chat box to ask for assistance or um, you can email us at uh, secretariat at ppsa-ph.org if this still doesn't work. Okay, uh, just a quick background about us, especially for uh, those who just came in for this session. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, PPSA, or the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture, uh, is a multi-stakeholder partnership platform for agriculture catalyzed by Grow Asia and the Philippine Department of Agriculture. Uh, we work to convene different stakeholders, uh, discuss various issues in agriculture, and of course, identify solutions for our smallholder farmers. Our setup is a public-private partnership one. So we have the Department of Agriculture, as our co-chair to represent the public sector and uh, Unilever Philippines for the private sector. Next slide, yeah. Uh, PPSA, as I have mentioned, was catalyzed by Grow Asia, which is a, a regional platform catalyzed by the World Economic Forum. Uh, Grow Asia works to convene uh, and facilitate action focus for partnerships in Southeast Asia. Uh, Grow Asia is also a recognized entity by the ASEAN Secretariat and our activities and programs are funded by different uh, multilateral organizations where the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or the Australian DFAT leads as the main funder. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is just a um, geographical representation of Grow Asia Network where its country partnerships are present, which include um, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam. We also have, Croatia is also present in the Pacific through the Papua New Guinea, and of course, the Philippines. Um, Croatia is headquartered in Singapore, and as you can see, for the uh, past five years, we have reached 1.8 million farmers through 44 working groups and 37 value chains. Uh, we are also a lean team. Actually, for the Philippines, it's just Ami and I are the ones overseeing the operations in the country and with strategic directions from the Grow Asia and uh, Pranav, our partnership manager. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, PPSA offers some of these work streams and uh, value to our members and partners, which include the knowledge and learning of which uh, actually part of it is what you are attending right now. Uh, we also have secretariat level activities, which include, uh, of course, but not limited to market linkage and roadmap or policy support. And our main work is done through our working groups. Currently, um, we have five commodity-based working groups and two cross-cutting teams on agri-finance and research industry partnerships. So these working groups work uh, either to develop value chain projects or uh, push for a sectoral agenda. Um, we have working groups that are underway for their establishment, which uh, include uh, on digital fruits and rice. Okay, uh, that's it about us. If you want to know more about PPSA and Grow Asia, you may visit uh, growasia.org or you, you may reach us at secretarias at ppsa-ph.org. Okay, uh, now that you have learned the overview about us, and of course, uh, we want to know you as well. Uh, there is a poll that's going to, uh, yeah. 
that already appeared on your screen and we want to uh, choose among the options on which sector do you belong or affiliated affiliated with okay we should have at least 60 to 70 percent before we flash the results okay uh great I so we have um the dynamics of the group is uh flashed on your screen so we have the uh, a lot from the CSOs and NGOs. We also have uh, private from the private sector and, of course, from the government and academia. And, of course, we also have the from the farmer group. Okay, I think this is a good mix of participants. So we are expecting uh, different perspectives during the Q&A and the moderated, of course, the moderated discussion where everyone is invited to speak. Thank you for your participation. Now to share with you the objectives and the agenda of this session, may I invite PPSA's Country Director, Ami Chua, for the introduction. Thank you so much, VJ, and good afternoon, everyone. This is the, I think, seventh session of the PPSA Working Groups Learning Series, and we are happy to see familiar names from the past sessions, and of course, privileged to have new attendees. Welcome, everyone. Just to highlight what Vijay mentioned earlier, our goal and probably the goal of everyone here um, is to create win-win situations wherein both the demand and the supplier sides, the farmers and the partners and the rest of the value chain players succeed. That at the end of every project, we aim to witness improvements in practices, incomes, and even the quality of lives. As we all aim to develop and implement sustainable and inclusive projects that will transform our Filipino smallholder farmers into active and profitable market players, we organized this session for you to deliver tools and guidelines to better help you on program development, community engagement, monitoring and evaluation, and even gender mainstreaming. So for today, we have invited esteemed speakers from various agencies, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, or CSIRO, the Institute of Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, or ISEA, and of course our very own Grow Asia, to share tools and guidelines for responsible investments, ethical value chains, and transformational partnerships. You will also have AgroNegosio, a multi-stakeholders platform, to share with us a database or a collaborative database that will better inform our program development and decision-making related to value chain management. With this lineup of speakers, and of course, with the help of our guest moderator here, we are definite that we will have a rich discussion today. So please, we encourage you to participate in the discussions later and ask even your burning questions for us to better be informed on how to proceed with our inclusive value chains. Rest assured that even after today, PPSA will continuously be a partnership platform ready to work hand in hand with you as we all look out for our farmers and fisher folks. So again, thank you for devoting your time for this afternoon session. We hope you will find this session useful and also engaging. And we hope we can find ways to work together. Magandang hapon po and mabuhay from PTSA. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that, Ami. Okay, uh, let's go on with our first speaker for this session today who represents the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization or uh, CSIRO. Uh, Dr. Lily Lim Kamacha has over 15 years experience in value chain development and analysis. Her focus uh, is on supporting industry in an era of glo global change through applied systems approaches. She applies value chain analysis or uh, VCA to address key challenges such as climate adaptation, sustainable development, and social inclusion. Lily uses strong science communication and engagement techniques in her research working with a wide range of stakeholders, both in the public and private sectors. She has conducted VCA globally, working with multinational organizations, uh, NGOs, and smallholder farming communities. With this, I am now giving the mic to Lily. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present to you. I'll be sharing my screen uh, very shortly, and uh, you can you should be able to see it very soon. Um, 
as VJ has introduced, I work with CSIRO, which is Australia's National Science Agency. Pinoy po ako. I was born and bred in the Philippines and, and uh, moved to Australia uh, halfway through my, my lifetime um, currently. And, and um, yeah, started working, uh, building my career here. I'm very privileged to be uh, back in the Philippines, to be working with my, my countrymen again. Um, and uh, looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts about this very important area on, on inclusive value chains. So today I'm going to talk to you about designing for inclusive value chains, and I'll do that through a, a, a couple of projects that we've actually done and one that we are embarking on. Um, the photo you have here is a, a, a photo of um, a self-help group, a female self-help group in uh, India, in West Bengal. And they are actually quite a, a poor tribal uh, group. And they've come together uh, mostly to help each other out as, as um, wives of farmers. They, even though they farm, been farming their whole lives, they never identify themselves as a farmer because that's the male identity. But uh, by coming together, they start thinking of ways that to, to, to do better and with the support of many other entities, they've started creating a, uh, building a mango orchard. Um, now this orchard has become their sole income as the women in the household. And it's been quite interesting in that the, the, the although the money is not a lot, um, it, it does make a big difference to their, to their identity as farming women. Um, but there's a big story around this that I will um, uncover for you. So the context of that study that, um, that we talked to you about is that it's a funded study to look into um, socially inclusive agricultural intensification. So when we talk about agricultural intensification, it's any improvement we do around the, the, the uh, around our agricultural practices. The photo that I show here for you is a lot of intensification happening. That's okra over there. This is in ba in Bangladesh, uh, in a in a uh, um, in, as you can see, the soil seems very very dry. But actually, it's after they planted rice. Um, but the the water, when it's low, uh, when it's not when it's not rainy season and the water is low, it becomes very saline because they're quite close to the sea. Uh, and so the plants that they have to put in here need to be salt tolerant. First of all, they need to, to recognize that they have to plant something um, when it's not dry season. The next one is they need to find salt tolerant varieties for it. And then they have to put in place um, other practices, farm management practices to make sure that the plant actually survives, such as the mulch. Now, these might seem very obvious to you, but for certain types of farmers, the ones who really don't have a lot of experience or the ones that have been um, a part of uh, just a marginalized part of society, a lot of them don't have these skills. So this is intensification for them. And this is where our, 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 our capacity building makes a big difference. But behind all these farm management improvements that we do is really all about the people. So what we found is that the networks um, that, that actually help people understand what needs to be done are more important than the actual practices themselves. So this study here, it was, I was looking at um, social inclusion, looking at the various risks that marginalized and vulnerable farmers experienced. And in that process, we start to unpack that really the human dimension of, um, of agricultural intensification was very important when it comes to considering inclusion. So how did we go about doing that? Like, what? How did we start unpacking it from a, a science perspective? Um, what do we look into when we look into inclusion? Uh, what I show you here is a very rough systems diagram that we used to assess uh, a, a, quite a significant uh, space that we operate in when we look at agriculture and any improvements we make to it. So we are looking here at a, a, a marginalized and vulnerable community. And, the, and in the context of their operations, we wanted to look at what were the value chains that, um, that they were operating in. So that's the green blob. Um, what access do they have to resources that they need to be able to farm? So that's your agricultural inputs, which is the purple lavender um, blob in here, number two. Um, 
and then linked with that is how is water managed in these systems because in some systems water is managed by communities it's not just given it's not it's not rain fed uh, farming it has to be managed such as the 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 dikes and the sluice gates in bangladesh so that's the blue area and then very very importantly what um, are the social aspects of that influence all these dimensions. And we called it the human dimension because it's not just the, the community perspective, but the individual itself. What is their role and what that, that they play when we look into social inclusion? So that's the yellow part of it. Now you might think that this seems to be obvious. Sure, it's quite obvious. This, these are important things for that we as agriculturists tend to find uh, that we look into as a standard, but do we look at them all at the same time? Probably not. Um, we are unlikely to actually really consider um, value chains and water and human aspirations and agricultural inputs all at the same time. Why? Because it's quite difficult. From a science perspective, you have to pick into certain details and then you get lost in detail. It's just not the way we tend to do things. We like to focus on areas that we are experts in. But it's very important when we're dealing with human lives and we're talking about inclusion, that we start to understand that it, we operate in a broad system and that we need to be mindful that any change you make in one area will also affect the other. So I'm going to show you a horrendogram. And this is exactly, this is what we started working with when we looked at that value chain section, that, that green area. Um, and uh, there were some things that we started to understand. We tried to unpack, you know, how does it work? You know, what, 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 is, what is in the scope of this system? What's important for farmers and what, what contributes to inclusion and what doesn't? So there were four very basic things that we actually considered is one is uh, are the market conditions favorable for that kind of farmer? And two, well, can they grow it? Can they grow it first? And then are the market conditions favorable? Number three is what's the price that they get for the product? And what is the profit that they get? Because those two are very different things. Um, but around that, then there starts to be a lot of other factors that you come that come into play. Uh, very easily when we do supply chain um, analysis or value chain analysis, we try to understand who are the other competitors in there, what are the production costs, all these sorts of things. But we we don't normally take into account when we think of value chains, what are the relationships in there? How self-determined are people? Do they have the confidence to actually pursue things? Uh, what are the values and social norms that are very important for them that might actually uh, influence what they want to get out of this? So, um, so why do we do this? We want to know how the system works, but also we want to know where are the entry points and what are the pathways to that? Where are the areas that we really should be focusing on um, and how would it affect each other? So for example, if I said, I want to build new markets for this group of farmers that I'm helping, and I'm going to introduce them to another a, a big company who, the, who they might be able to sell to, what does that mean in terms of their ability to produce the product, their selling costs, whether they will stick to the contracts that you help facilitate with them? You know, what are the urgencies and aspirations and, and, and values that they need to take into to account getting into that situation? So that's the purpose of this. Um, it's actually to unpack whether or not the interventions that you design are actually going to be effective and does it take into account other things that are happening in the system. So as an example, in India and Bangladesh, we saw farmers diversifying their crops. So you can actually model that in a quantitative manner. You can model it through the system. We also saw them accessing new markets for, for example, organic spinach to Bhutan. That was a new market and a new crop as well. So we were able to, to model that. But other things were a little bit harder to model, but also worth looking into. So for example, they were able, some of these um, farmers and communities did not have any identity documents because they were in the lower cast, uh, lowest castes in, in these societies. And as a result, they don't have access to finance. They couldn't send their kids to school, even though that was a public school, because they just didn't, they were in persona non grata. So they just didn't exist. Um, once we were able to assist with that, 
it opened up the doors to empowerment. It just allowed them to function as part of society. And that allowed them to be included so much more than diversifying their crops or accessing new markets. So these are the things that when you start to understand what are the true barriers to inclusion beyond what your normal space is, then you start to realize the strength of the pa different pathways and different partners you have available. Um, so if there is one key point I would like to leave from this slide is that there are several pathways to support the development of inclusive value chains and understanding them and that broader environment that you operate in is really important um, because choosing the one pathway on the onset could actually lead to exclusion. So when I say a pathway, it's one intervention or one solution or, or um, uh, one strategy because inclusion is in the eye of the beholder as opposed to our own eyes. So what does it mean then for developing a new programs, uh, new pro bodies of work? So the, the, the work that we uh, talked to you about was is already finished and it's happened in India and West Bengal. We now have the privilege of looking at inclusive value chains in the Philippines. Now the context is very, very different. Um, the, 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 you know, the culture is very different. Uh, the, the aspirations are very different on a community basis. But what we want to do is bring some of these principles along in that working with the communities very closely, listening to them and listening to their aspirations and needs, um, and working with different types of stakeholders along the way, understanding that broader system could actually help you reach um, a, a better understanding of what inclusion is for the people that you want to benefit. Um, and inclusion is not just for the sake of inclusion. Inclusion is actually a step towards something else. So there's a benefit that people want out of inclusion. And that is what, is, that, that is what could vary. Um, what we want to see through this body of work is by understanding that broader system, being able to uh, identify the leverage points, the entry points, the interventions that we could work with, we can start having different pathways to actually facilitate inclusion and help those farmers and communities get the benefits that they want out of this. Um, so this is a, a project uh, to be funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. And we're working with a range of partners in the Philippines. Some of them are on this call. Uh, we're really, really privileged to be doing that. Um, the main thing is it's, a, it's an integrated project that doesn't select the pathways um, uh, doesn't select a single pathway to get to the point that we want to. Um, that's really important because some of the changes that we are looking to, to see could take a very long time to happen. They would probably take um, beyond the project before we actually see them. So it's important that you would create an environment around these communities that could support that long-term vision um, and that lo those long-term objectives. I'm on my last slide and I just want to make sure that there are three things that you keep with you um, after this talk and that, you know, the first thing is the inclusion is in the eye of the beholder and we all have very different priorities and goals. Understanding what those different goals are and what we want out of inclusion is very, very important and making that explicit in a partnership model is going to be key. Um, Think in systems. So system thinkers, thinkers are really, really important right now. You can see that in COVID. And when in considering inclusion, that enables you to broadly capture the different spaces and partners that you need to work with. So just step out of your comfort zone. Um, and we all have a different role to play. Being aware of your specific role is very, very important because each role has its own type of impact that you can make. But working together with people that you don't normally work with can actually amplify that work significantly, um, that, that impact too. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and the discussion that happens after. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that, Lily. Um, uh, well, I think you have just trained us on. I think you have just trained us briefly to have a nose and eye, especially, well, in the topic of uh, around inclusion, what to look at and what to consider among others. Okay, for our participants, you know the drill. If you have any questions to Dr. Lily and to our uh, succeeding speakers, just use the Q and A box to type in your questions.
Okay. Uh, we're going uh, into our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Marilisa M. Dakanay is the founding president of the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, or ISEA. She is a mentor of social entrepreneurs, a pioneer in research and education on social entrepreneurship in Asia, and an advocate for developing collaborative partnerships between social enterprises, businesses, and governments to achieve the sustainable development goals. She was uh, recently recognized by the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and World Economic Forum as the Outstanding Social Innovation Thought Leader of the Year 2019. Among the pioneering initiatives she, she has led was a multi-country research that resulted to a set of benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains, which uh, she will be talking about later. Uh, These uh, benchmarks are in inspiring a platform for building back better, involving social enterprises, agribusinesses, and governments in ASEAN and beyond as they confront the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on agricultural supply chains. Dr. Dakanai holds a Master in Development Management with distinction from the Asian Institute of Management and a PhD from the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. With that, over to you, Dr. Uh, Lisa. Um, thank you, Vijay, uh, and good, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I will be making a presentation on the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains. Um, particularly a scorecard that we developed for corporations as a tool for developing, monitoring, and evaluating inclusive, inclusive value chains. So may I have my first slide, please? So these benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains, that's BTP, we in ABC is a mouthful, but uh, that's the tool, the scorecard is a tool that we have developed um, as a monitoring and evaluation and planning tool for corporations uh, under a project that we have been doing since 2015. The benchmarks actually resulted from a, an action research uh, of best practices among um, social enterprises and inclusive businesses that have made a significant impact on small scale producers, especially women in agricultural value chains. No? And this is funded by uh, Oxfam and the uh, Swedish Embassy in Bangkok. And uh, I just wanted to first share some insights that we got from that benchmarking research. And um, one of the insights that we got from that research was uh, the reason why companies actually uh, directly engage small producers is that um, companies directly engage small producers as suppliers because they want to address traceability and quality issues required by certain markets, uh, especially those that are linked to sustainable consumption and production systems. Uh, they're wanting to access resources so that a com uh, for the company's development and growth because there are some resources that are actually available if uh, companies uh, directly engage small producers rather than ju just buy from traders their agricultural inputs. And um, there, it's also um, important in terms of substantiating a company's desire to be a responsible business. And uh, small producers are able to provide the needed quality, quantity, and delivery requirements of the market when they are effectively enabled to do so with three things, no, adequate inputs, appropriate technology, and community-based innovation. Uh, the third insight related to engagement with small producers is that the best supplier communities are those that are organized into self-governing producer organizations that have achieved a high level of empowerment. So that's one set of insights. Uh, second set of insights have to do with, next slide please, um, why and how uh, companies can engage uh, women small producers. And women small producers are actually uh, already playing various roles in agriculture and agricultural value chains. But as, um, as we know, when we say farmer, fisher, we usually are culturally trained. We think about men. No? So while women are, women small producers actually are playing various roles in agriculture and agricultural value chains, they are invisible. So they're not recognized. If they are, um, if they are uh, engaged, they are unpaid or underpaid. 
And when engaged, their participation is limited or constrained by uh, organizational and social cultural and other barriers, including the responsibility for unpaid care work. So for example, women who are engaged uh, in agricultural value chains, even if they're well-meaning, sometimes they have, um, they have uh, unintended negative impacts. Um, so uh, another thing is that um, the non-engagement of women usually results to loss of opportunities and opportunity costs. Um, um, a third set of insights have to do with um, the role and transformation of our responsible business. Um, responsible businesses um, are playing important roles in agricultural value chains as markets, as social investors, and as partners of small producers. Uh, but side by side with that, um, usually in agricultural value chain interventions where responsible businesses are serving as market social investors and partners of small producers, they usually work with small producers cooperatives, social enterprises, and non-government organizations that are actually playing an important role in enabling women and men small scale producers to be effective and engaging these corporations or businesses. And uh, thirdly, uh, responsible businesses that succeed in transforming themselves and their producer communities um, have and can do so uh, mostly in partnership with enabling institutions and programs. And that's the reason actually why, why the, the program that we have uh, for enabling uh, companies to become um, uh, transformational partners uh, and enablers of women uh, in agricultural value chains is very important. Next slide, please. So let me now talk about the benchmarks. The benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chain interventions that we developed, which as I said, is a set of um, um, the insights or the factors that we found to be the most important elements that contribute to significant impact on women and men small scale producers in agricultural value chain interventions. Uh, it has eight elements. Now, the first is appropriate technology and community based or oriented innovations. I'm not going to be able to give you uh, too many uh, explanations and examples. So I'll just go through this eight. Uh, and if you're interested, you can actually look at our website because this is actually uh, explained and presented in documents and uh, papers that are available in our website. So first is appropriate technology and community-based or oriented innovations. The second is that the interventions actually work towards having the small-scale producers uh, achieve a more substantive share of value created in the value chain because they're not relegated to being uh, producers of uh, raw materials forever, but they're actually assisted to move up the value chain. And then the, the, we also found out that tra transformational partnerships um, that impact on women and men small-scale producers invest in the food security and resilience of the small producers' communities. They also invest in the empowerment of small-scale producers, um, especially in, in, in developing uh, self-governing institutions no, of these small producers. And then the fifth benchmark has to do with um, stewardship and sustainable consumption and production. Uh, the sixth benchmark has to do with transactional and transformational services. There are two types of services that are provided to the small-scale producers. The transactional services that are actually services needed by the market, um, for, needed for the small producers to produce the quantity, quality, and delivery requirements of the market. But the other set of services are what we call transformational services. These are what the small producers need in order for them to actually uh, become self-governing institutions that can um, work for their for their to change their own lives and to change uh, to make decisions uh, as well as to improve their own um, participation in the value chain. And um, the seventh benchmark has to do with uh, in encouraging or promoting women's participation and empowerment. And the eighth benchmark has to do with measurable outcomes of transformation. So anyway, we found that these elements need to be or are the, are the benchmarks that or the, the standards that best practices in agricultural value chains uh, that have had an impact on women and men small producers, they, this is what are needed in order for that impact to happen. 
Next slide, please. Uh, we trans we further uh, further on we this project uh, actually started in 2015, no? but by 2017 when we already evolved the benchmarks as the insights, no? we actually started to develop um, scorecards for different players for different actors in the agricultural value chains. And we developed scorecards for corporate agribusinesses. We developed scorecards for SMEs and social enterprises. And we also developed a set of scorecards for agricultural value chain programs as a whole. But I'd be sharing to you the um, corporate agribusiness scorecard. No? So we found that uh, we, we developed a scorecard, though that it came from the eight principles or the eight insights, um, when we transformed it into, it into an actual scorecard, it became four elements because uh, we actually considered uh, the roles that corporate agribusinesses do and uh, what they can and cannot do, but they, which things that they can do uh, to contribute to the benchmarks um, as partners. No? And uh, the first has to do with the alignment of um, philanthropic and social investments towards developing small producer communities to participate in the com company supply chain. And um, this we gave, uh, the scorecard uh, gives this 20 points. And uh, the second has to do with strategic partnerships with cooperatives and social enterprises of small producers and their enablers to achieve mutually beneficial objectives. No? And uh, this is, this we also gave this uh, a set of 20 points. And then the third um, scorecard element is engagement in value chain practices that enhance women's participation and economic empowerment. And uh, we gave this 40 points. Um, and then the fourth element is measurement and communication of responsible business outcomes at the level of the company, its supply chain, partner women and men small scale producers and their organizations. So this is about responsible business outcomes and we gave it 20 points. So the scorecard actually has, um, you, if you get a perfect score, it's a hundred, yeah? And um, the, each of these um, elements actually have a set of key result areas. And I just wanted to show you just for purposes of this discussion, one of the key result areas under the third uh, under the third uh, element, which is engagement with um, uh, women and men, uh, women, uh, small scale producers. And uh, the, the one of the 10 key result areas has to do with the company having a formal gender equality or diversity and inclusion policy that ensures fair and non-discriminatory principles. No? And there are actually three, um, equal pay for equal work, equal opportunities for women to avail of services and programs. And the third is providing and promoting women-friendly spaces and culture in the workplace. An example of a women-friendly space or culture in the workplace is having breastfeeding spaces yeah, for nursing mothers. Yeah. And um, anyway, so uh, each of these key result areas are given a score. And in this particular context, there's a score of four. So for this key result area of uh, the company having a formal gender equality or diversity and inclusion policy that ensures fair and non-discriminatory discriminatory principles, um, we give a score of zero if they have no policy uh, we give a score of one if they have a policy and practice in promoting at least two of the three gender equality principles um, in the, at the level of the enterprise. We give a score of three when they actually, <clears throat> we give a score of two when they have at least um, two, of the two of the three gender equality principles, not only at the enterprise level, but at the level of the value chain or the engagement with a small producers. Yeah? And then uh, we give a score of three when they are promoting all three of the gender equality principles in its enterprise and value chain operations. And then finally, the perfect score of four is given if uh, the company has a comprehensive policy and practice and regular, a regular mechanism to plan, implement, monitor, evaluate, and undertake continuous improvement of their pol this policy and practice. So you get a score of four for this. 
<clears throat> so um, if you remember the, the past slide, uh, which has one, uh, four elements. No? So each of these elements is divided into key result areas. And each of the key result areas have a scoring guideline such as this. Next slide, please. Um, and then we have also a score interpretation. Uh, there's actually two scores no, from the benchmark scorecard. One score is at uh, the extent to which you are transformation, a transformational partner to women and men small scale producers. No? But uh, the, the other score has to do with uh, your uh, being an enabler to, to what extent you are an enabler of women's economic empowerment. And there are actually 60 um, 60 points uh, in the whole, in the score of 100 in the whole uh, scorecard. There's 60 points that actually are um, considered part of the women's economic empowerment score. And um, if you get a score of 30 or below, you uh, your company practice is actually uh, aware. Uh, you're you're we aware, no? And then if you get a score of 31 to 46, your a company is a responsive enabler of women's economic empowerment. And then if you get a score of 47 to 60, you are a transformative enabler of women's economic empowerment. So this is a scoring system that we actually develop. Next slide, please. So uh, we engage corporations as, as potential transformational partners and we enablers or women's economic empowerment enablers in agricultural value chains through different um, processes. No? First is we actually introduce the benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chain scorecard uh, as an evaluation, planning, and learning tool. So we're actually partnering with uh, corporations in, in, uh, with the assistance of PBSP and PPSA to uh, work with us to become, um, to, to use these benchmarks um, as an evaluation planning and learning tool for their company. And then um, the second set of um, activities that we do is capacity building and action consulting. Uh, because of COVID-19, we have had to adjust our action consulting processes to include an evaluation of the COVID-19 impact on the small scale producers in the supply chain of the company or the corporation as part uh, to input into their corporation's inclusive recovery plan. And then we also assist in the baseline study on the practice of the benchmarks uh, from the perspective of small producers. So these are done um, as part of the services that we provide. And then the third is we conduct a two-day orientation and planning workshop. And this orientation planning workshop is actually a time that we orient and uh, provide um, a capacity development uh, intervention for the use of the scorecard no? so that uh, uh, the company is able to um, use it uh, as a, an evaluation planning tool. And then in that uh, two-day orientation and planning workshop, there's also a women's economic empowerment plan that gets uh, developed out of the assessment of the weaknesses and strengths of the company uh, after going through the two-day orientation and planning workshop. And then, of course, uh, uh, based on the Women's Economic Empowerment Plan that has been developed, we assist in the planning, uh, uh, in the implementation of the WE Plan, of the Women's Economic Empowerment Plan. Finally, we actually are partnering in engaging government, uh, partnering with corporations to also engage government. Uh, we're trying to enshrine a set of guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains at the ASEAN level and at the country level with the Department of Agriculture, for example. And uh, these guidelines um, are actually a set of policies and incentives and mechanisms that would incentivize, uh, promote the practice of the benchmarks in agricultural value chains. So this is basically uh, the set of uh, uh, these are the things that we do in order for us to assist uh, corporations uh, who are interested to become transformational partners and women's economic empowerment enablers in their respective agricultural value chains. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, po, uh, Ms. Lisa, for sharing with us the benchmarks that you help develop, which, well, I see is very helpful in transforming agribusinesses and 
corporations towards uh, inclusion. Again, if you have questions to uh, Lisa and Lily, you may send them using the Q&A box. We will let our speakers to answer your questions during the moderated discussion. Okay. Um, our third speaker for this session uh, is Arian Sweeney, who is the Manager of Sustainable Business and Investment at Grow Asia, uh, a multi-stakeholder partnership platform that catalyzes action on inclusive agricultural development in Southeast Asia. Um, Ariel leads the implementation of the action plan for the ASEAN Guidelines on Responsible Agricultural Investments, or RAI, as well as Grow Asia's Gender Mainstreaming Initiatives. Erin is, is trained as an urban planner specializing in food systems policy and has worked and lived in the United States, South America, South Asia, and the Caribbean. Erin was a Fulbright Scholar based in Singapore, where she conducted research on urban food systems and consumer demand for locally grown food. With that, over to you, Erin. Thanks so much, VJ. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. So I'd like to take everyone on the webinar today through the set of guidelines that GrowAsia is working to promote in the region, focused on promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry. This, these guidelines are a guidance framework. So what I'll do today is talk about how this project is actually developing and setting up monitoring systems for the project itself, but then also some of the ways that we're hoping to support our partners to be able to measure their own impact when they're making investments in agri-value chains. And I'll cover a series of these plans with you over the course of the presentation. Next slide, please. Just to give a bit of context, this is the some of the reasons that we see a need for guidance related to investments in ASEAN. So we know that agriculture and forestry are very important sectors in this region. Agriculture employs 100 million people or one sixth of the population and generates 12% of the regional GDP. We're also seeing an increase in foreign direct investments in agriculture from certain parts of the world, including the EU and notably Japan over the last five years. So we recognize that there's an interest in this sector and very keen to make sure that these investments are happening responsibly. Next slide, please. So this is where the ASEAN guidelines come in. These guidelines provide guidance to ASEAN member states, as well as agribusinesses and financial investors about 10 key thematic areas that these stakeholders should consider before, during, and after investments are made. So I think many of you in the audience probably recognize these thematic areas. They're very similar to ESG targets uh, that companies, banks, governments, and CSOs may already be setting for yourselves. The ASEAN RAI guidelines are meant to be applicable to investments along any agri or forestry value chain and might include things like plantations, input production facilities, mills, refineries, packing plants, canneries, or lumber mills. And in 2017, Grow Asia was contacted by the ASEAN Secretariat to help them develop the language for these guidelines. This was done in partnership with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and of course, the ASEAN Secretariat themselves. And then the ASEAN Ministers of Agriculture and Forestry during the senior officials meeting of 2018 officially adopted the language from these guidelines, which then gives us license to operate. And we're now working toward a 10-year action plan, which I'll share with you in just a moment. Next slide, please. We recognize that there are some key areas of value add with these guidelines, and I often highlight them to demonstrate the relevance of the guidelines amongst the, the many other standards that exist. So the guidelines are aligned with nine SDGs. So that's at the core of many existing commitments of agribusinesses and financial institutions, as well as ASEAN governments. They're applicable to investors who have supply chains in multiple commodities and Southeast Asian countries. They're based on internationally recognized standards set by the Committee for World Food Security in 2015, but they're contextualized to fit the ASEAN uh, region and the unique challenges and opportunities that we face here. 
And although the guidelines are voluntary as of now, the aim is to integrate them into national level investment policies as well as into private sector processes. And that will then create incentives for both sides to continue to adopt these guidelines. Next slide, please. The ASEAN riots certainly encourage a multi-stakeholder process so that no single actor is alone, ensuring that investments in agri-value chains are made with responsible practices. The language of the ASEAN RAI guidelines does provide specific roles for each of these stakeholder groups, and we provide that on our website, so I encourage you to take a look there. Next slide, please. Each guideline gives specific guidance, both to ASEAN member states as well as those other stakeholders. And I'll share with you uh, guideline 10, which is the last of the 10 guidelines. And that says that investors and ASEAN member states should contribute to strengthening regional approaches to responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry sectors in ASEAN. So for ASEAN member states, that means doing things like harmonizing standards and regulations across the region, providing incentives to private sector actors in a race to the top to do better with responsible investments, to adopt international good practices around responsible investing, and then of course to cooperate across different ASEAN member states as both the location where the investor might be based as well as where the investment itself is taking place. Next slide, please. So then we have guidelines for the agribusinesses and financial institutions engaged as well. For agribusinesses, we encourage them to join regional food, agriculture, and forestry organizations, but also to take care and to invest time and resources into managing any negative externalities that exist in cross-border investments. There are several other guidelines for agribusinesses, but I just won't go into detail right now. Again, they're available on the website. And then for financial institutions, we encourage them to share insights and their own financing priorities at our upcoming regional events and workshops, but also that they commit to engaging with local stakeholders at investment sites to conduct their due diligence processes. And Groasia will be working together with both of these groups to encourage them to take up these practices. Next slide, please. So I'd like to do a quick poll just to uh, make sure that everyone is still engaged, but also to find out what motivates your organization to adopt responsible investment or supply chain practices. So if everyone could go ahead and just give your responses to the poll that you see on your screen, that would be fantastic. And we may give about 10 to 15 additional seconds for the response. I'll let my colleagues on the back end see when we've got enough responses and then go ahead and share those results with everyone so you can all see what motivations your organization or organizations on this call today uh, use to adopt these responsible practices. Fantastic. And so it looks like reducing risks is of key importance, but we also see an interest in higher return on investment or new market access. These are very similar to the responses that we hear across our partnerships in Groasia. So that's fantastic to see. Next slide, please. I always get the question when we're talking about these ASEAN guidelines, but what are the specific incentives for the private sector to adopt such guidelines? We know that the guidelines were written with ASEAN member states in mind, and that our ultimate goal is to see these guidelines embedded into national policy frameworks. But we also know that the private sector needs to be taking up these guidelines and embedding these practices into their own internal practices. So we see about six reasons, and I'll go through them quickly. The first is really to respond to the policy change that we know will be coming as a result of the ASEAN member states adopting these guidelines. For now, we see that responsible investments might be kind of a nice to have, but we do know that in the near future, those responsible practices will be required to have license to operate in country. The second is to be more competitive among the other agribusiness peers. The third is to be able to unlock sustainable financing. In 2019, we saw a rise in ASEAN of examples of agriculture and forestry investments made with interesting blended finance facilities um, and looking at specifically impact investments, as well as a slightly newer phenomenon, which is sustainability linked loans that are made by traditional banks. The fourth is to communicate 
commitments. So it's absolutely an image booster to be able to talk about responsible practices um, and to be able to attract talent to join into these companies and actually be excited to be involved in the, the practices of that company. We know that COVID-19 will is already showing us that we need to embed resiliency into investments, that that is a key aspect of building back better. And we also know that COVID has intensified some of the existing risks that you all just said you'd like to reduce, uh, such as labor rights and climate change. And then lastly, the opportunity to learn from one another and to participate in networks like GrowAsia or the PPSA to really have investors be able to talk openly and learn from one another. Next slide, please. We also know that there are still many challenges to adopting any type of guidance framework or standards for both the public sector and the private sector. And those things include uncertainty about regional demand for sustainably produced products, there's the cost of time, human resources, and capital to take that extra step to embed responsible practices. There's even a lack of knowledge or awareness about how to start, kind of where do we start on a sustainability journey with our investments, especially if the information that's currently out in the region isn't reaching the right target audience or the right uh, staff within, say, an uh, agribusiness. And then lastly, there are many already existing certifications and standards that bring added value for specific industries or sectors or even different types of investments. Um, but we know that some of our partners internally struggle to identify which standards might be the best fit and help them access new markets. So it, it can be a confusing landscape. Next slide. We've considered all of these challenges in the action plan that the partners that I described earlier, including GrowAsia, have put together. And that action plan is uh, for 10 years, and we aim that by 2030, we can facilitate a measurable increase in responsible and sustainable private sector investment in food, agriculture, and forestry here in ASEAN. And we have a four pillar approach. So I've already talked about pillar one, where we'll be supporting ASEAN member states to integrate these guidelines directly into national policies. Pillar two, which will train up over 400 experts in the region to really understand how to practically apply the ASEAN Rai on the ground. And that program will be launched by late 2021. The third area is to hold regional annual events to do that best practice and information sharing among investors, governments, CSOs, and farmer organizations, as well as providing capacity building workshops. And then lastly, really encouraging uptake of the ASEAN Rai among the private sector by providing examples like case studies of how is this already working in the field and aligning the ASEAN Rai guidelines to those existing standards and certifications to help reduce confusion and um, create more efficient systems for our partners. Next slide, please. So I'll just quickly share with you two different tools that we're currently developing to um, both create a baseline so that we can then measure the progress of this project over time, but also to encourage, again, uptake of these guidelines by both the public sector and the private sector. Next slide, please. So for the public sector, our partner, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, has set up an ASEAN alignment audit tool. And this is the process that uh, ASEAN member states will go through um, based on their own request where they'll actually be able to conduct their own self-assessment of existing policies to see how they already align to the 10 thematic areas of the ASEAN RAI guidelines. And then ideally we'll have other ASEAN member states come in to review that self-assessment, determine the degree of alignment to the ASEAN RAI guidelines, and then have ASEAN member states be able to access technical and legal support from our partners to actually embed uh, this language into existing or new policies. Next slide, please. This is just an example of what the ASEAN alignment tool will look like. Again, it's designed for ASEAN member states, but it also may be able to be used by CSOs, farmer organizations, or even agribusiness to advocate for policy change that they would like to see based on the ASEAN RAI. Next slide, please. The second approach, of course, is to engage with the private sector and align the ASEAN RAI guidelines to existing standards. And again, we know that there are so many standards and principles available to agribusinesses and financial institutions when they're looking to implement 
responsible or inclusive business practices and investments. So our aim was really to understand if a company had already aligned themselves to any certification or standard, would they also be able to demonstrate compliance with the ASEAN RAI framework? So we've commissioned a report and I'll provide a link in just a moment to that report that essentially looked at 10 industry certifications and standards and four investment standards. And we chose these based on the most relevant commodities here in ASEAN to understand again, the alignment between all of these standards and the ASEAN RAI guidelines. We also looked at 10 international banks commitments to all of these standards that you see here on the screen as a way to understand how financial institutions are already making commitments to responsible and inclusive practices and how we might be able to, again, therefore easily embed the ASEAN guidelines into their policies. Next slide, please. I'll just share a couple key takeaways from the report, but again, I'll share it with you so you can read it at your own time. We essentially found that companies who have existing commitments to those certifications and standards require very little effort to show alignment to the ASEAN RAI or then to be able to adopt the ASEAN RAI guidelines, which is great news. The guideline that was uh, least aligned is that guideline 10 focused on uh, the regional component of the ASEAN guidelines, and that was not explicitly covered by most of the standards you just saw. So that's really a value add and an opportunity for our project to step in and help our partners understand how they can better take a regional approach to responsible investing. The third is that those 10 international banks that I mentioned really vary in their uptake of various standards. And so we're interested now to see what our ASEAN member states, uh, sorry, banks in ASEAN member states or uh, country level banks doing in terms of their own commitments. So that will actually be a next step and a next iteration of the report for us. Next slide, please. You can grab the QR code here to actually access this report, um, but we'll also be providing, I think, the slides to everyone so you can get the QR code from that later on. And just to say that we will be also launching several other online tools for our private sector partners to be able to directly compare their existing certifications and standards to the ASEAN RAI guidelines, and therefore, again, really make the process as efficient as possible. Next slide, please. One more poll just as I get ready to wrap up. So if I can have the poll launched, this question is around what incentives or support are most likely to encourage your organization to follow responsible investment practices. So you have five options and these require a few seconds to understand. So I'll give everyone about 15 seconds to reply to this poll. And then when it looks like we have most people replying, we can go ahead and share the results. Great. Can we go ahead and just uh, publish the results for everyone to see? Oh, we have 35% respond there. And you wanted to go uh, up slightly? Yes, that would be great. So for everyone who has uh, been doing something else during the webinar or for whom uh, you're just finding the right answer, if you can vote, that would be fantastic. Five more seconds, maybe. Great. Okay, fantastic. So we're seeing that participating in multi-stakeholder platforms, roundtables, or standards is certainly uh, an interesting way to actually incentivize or support organizations to take up responsible practices. That's great news because that's exactly what we intend to do with this action plan, but also what many of the partners on today's call are already doing uh, with your own constituents and partners. Next slide, please. I'll just leave you with a couple of ways to get involved. So we will be putting together a case study series and we encourage you to submit any recent investment that you or a partner might have made in ASEAN. And we'll work with you to see if it would be a good fit for this case study series. We encourage anyone who's interested to join our six month blended learning program, which as I mentioned, will be launched at the end of 2021. And then sooner we'll be holding our annual regional event. So look out for that by the middle of 2021. And lastly, we will be responding to ASEAN member states requests for that technical support after they fill out the ASEAN audit alignment tool. So stay tuned for more information about that. And just to say that the PPSA team is going to be engaging their partners on the RAI in the coming months and you'll receive more information on that as well.
Last slide, please. And thank you so much for your attention. You'll be able to receive my contact information and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that, Erin, uh, for sharing with us about the uh, the RAI and the updates that's going to happen on it. Uh, just to share in relation to promoting the responsible agricultural investment, uh, there is a, an RAI advocacy forum in the Philippines, spearheaded by uh, Asia Dra and Field Dra, where uh, PPSA is one of the first initial members. All right. Um, again, uh, the Q&A box is... Uh, Waiting for your questions, just give it a try and uh, use it for your uh, curiosity, uh, especially for uh, the topics that have been uh, discussed earlier. Um, okay. Um, anyway, our last but definitely not the least speaker is uh, Melanie Molenio, who currently supports various organizations and policymakers in the region as a consultant. She previously worked with the Philippine Board of Investments of the Department of Trade and Industry as the Inclusive Business Program Director. And uh, she also uh, worked for the Philippine Business for Social Progress, or PBSP. Uh, she has worked with uh, nonprofit, public, and private sector institutions in the U.S. and the Philippines on social development, information technology, accounting, and finance, among others. She has been supporting startups, the latest of which... Uh, is uh, Agronegosio, which was formed during the, this pandemic to help address certain gaps in the uh, agri-sector. She earned her master's degree in uh, business administration from the University of South Florida. With that, I am now giving the mic to Ms. Mel. Thanks, BJ. Uh, hold on. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, Miss Mary. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you to Grow Asia and PPSA for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm actually here to uh, share about what we have done. No? Just to correct VJ, actually, Agro Negosho has been around since 2017. It's just that uh, this pandemic, uh, we decided to repurpose, no? to redefine the purpose of the program uh, due to some assessments that we did in the last couple of years. So why did we start Agronegosio? I mean, we always see community-based enterprises, you know, clamor about the lack of access uh, to market. So we thought then that why not start an e-commerce platform? And then so we did. So in 2017, we developed a, an e-commerce platform that specifically targeted cooperatives and uh, MSMEs as merchants. Uh, the platform provided the payment gateway as well as logistics. So if you're thinking about e-commerce, it sounds perfect, right? I mean, the merchants sell and then the consumers buy. But then we realized that it was not really the case. You know, we had encountered certain issues, for example, on the payment gateway. As we know, many people are still kind of uh, cautious, I suppose, in buying and using credit cards, you know, in buying stuff from the internet. But still, this, in this issue on the payment gateway is actually more manage manageable. Uh, logistics, however, is a different matter. Um, when we see, for example, the drivers, you know, the delivery guys of Grab, Mr. Speedy and other logistics company, uh, we tend to feel that ordering online can be done easily, right? But uh, this might be the case only in Metro Manila in, a, in other key cities, not so much uh, to areas outside of these, you know, uh, metros or the key cities. Um, an example that we encountered um, was a linkage between a rice cooperative in Nueva Ecija to a food chain in Metro Manila. So the price that uh, was reached was good, acceptable to both parties. The buying volume was also good. Uh, the company wanted to buy four metric tons of rice weekly for its chains of stores in chain of stores in Metro Manila. And uh, it sounded good. However, while this volume may seem big enough, I mean, um, four metric ton weekly is okay for, you know, for a co-op, um, this would present actually a challenge. 
to a cooperative located in Nueva Ecija. Uh, you see, a tract load of rice is usually around 20 to 25 metric tons. Uh, to be cost efficient, the delivery to Metro Manila should fill up the truck. So the buyer does not have a warehouse, so delivery of four metric tons weekly is really non-negotiable. Um, doing this will you know, drive the logistics cost up. In the end, you know, the agreement was canceled and the company reverted back to its traders, you know, to the, to the traders at its supplier. So the, these are really act some of the actual um, issues that we encountered in developing the, you know, the e-commerce platform. So to add to the issues mentioned, uh, we also thought that, you know, it will be good to, you know, provide cooperatives a means to track and monitor the production of its members. Um, when a company usually would approach a cooperative, you know, how much, how much volume do you produce per harvest? It's usually done on an estimate basis, but uh, there is really, you know, it's, it's seldom that they have actual documentation as to, you know, who are the farmers that will contribute to this volume and such. So um, this means that for the company, uh, they will only get the aggregate information, you know, how much volume was brought from the cooperatives, how much is the total cost of the contract. Um, but they, they don't really go to the, in the, down to the individual level. So to add value to the process and to make things easier for the cooperatives, we added features such as profiling of individual farmers and, of course, the production and consolidation module. Now, with these features, the cooperative can, can have traceability of their supplies down to the individual level. We thought then that things were starting to change. However, we realized that the community-based enterprises uh, were, were, were not really ready to pay for this kind of services. You see, a platform like AgroNegocio would usually thrive on a per transaction cost or a subscription you know, service. Um, because the co-ops, or the uh, farmers associations are not really keen on paying for such um, service, the, the sustainability of the company is now being questioned, you know. Uh, well, most of these organizations are reliant on grants and assistance from government agencies. So why go for a, pay, a paying service, right, a, a, a paid service? Uh, so we decided that, that, you know, okay, it, I suppose it's really about time for us to reevaluate, you know, um, our business model. And so we did. And we went back again to see, you know, what actually have we done? You know, while the platform has to a certain extent addressed the market linkage issue, have we really created impact? I mean, that's another issue on top of the sustainability of the company. And um, have we actually... Looking at this chart, you know, have we actually helped buyers source down a level? Perhaps we have because we, we provided a direct link to the cooperatives, but have we actually helped producers move up a level? Most likely we did not. You know, the sellers on the platform were mostly already market ready. So we didn't really do anything. You know, we just tapped on the commodities, the products that they had and, and sold it through the platform. And so we said, um, should we really go through that route, you know, and engage with the already market ready enterprises? Or should we should we go for the others that don't really, you know, that really need uh, assistance? And so we, we decided to went back and reassess our business model and redefine our purpose. So this happened only a month ago, you know, when they, we decided that, okay, let's move into a different direction. So that's what we did. So what we did, what we decided to do now is a chain-wide uh, collaboration. So this is um, what we did right now. Um, for the cooperatives, for example, uh, what can this uh, chain-wide collaboration platform, you know, do? Uh, first of all, you know, the cooperatives can profile their individual members. Of course, they can take advantage of the consolidation and production module, uh, connect directly with the institutional buyers, 
and access the needed support from development organizations, government organizations, and other partners. So in the end, what we wanted to do is reduce the reliance of the cooperatives or the community-based enterprises uh, from grants. For the companies, what the companies can do is you know, correctly, connect directly to the suppliers, uh, have traceability of their supplies down to the farmer level, and in the process, get evidence-based reports. You know, um, the company because it is able to you know uh, profile the, the the performance of the project down to the individual level can actually you now produce reports um, uh, for sustain sustainability reports for the SEC submission, for example, of the company as well as for their annual reports. Now, the other actors in the system, on top of the company and the uh, community, would be academic institutions, you know, wherein they can now get evidence-based or data-driven information on the project and have chan a chance, you know, to build uh, cases and uh, best uh, practices, document best practices based on data-driven, you know, um, uh, outputs. The CSOs and NGOs as well can track their interventions. Um, that they give to the companies as well as those of others. Why did we think about this? You know, they, they, for example, an, an NGO will enter into the system and be part of the platform. So it can also put into the system uh, who are the recipients of specific um, um, capacity building uh, activities that they have. So in the process of designing their intervention, they will be able to see uh, who exactly has given what. So we will minimize, in that way, we can, we can minimize the duplication of activities between development organizations as well as government agencies. So in, in the process, we are also maximizing the, the use of resources. So that's what we are thinking. Because when we go down to the ground, sometimes we see cooperatives that has received, for example, in the past years, uh, in the past year, training on financial literacy. So I mean, why, why did you, uh, go into uh, the training three times. It's because you know that the organizations that go down to the ground are providing the same training, and they just keep on receiving, you know, the training. Uh, but however, the, co the the CSOs and NGOs don't really also know what has been given. So through the platform, we are hoping that we can align the interventions being given by the, the CSOs and NGOs. Uh, we are also bringing in financial institutions into the system so that the cooperatives can put uh, can make certain calls that they need um, production loans, for example, for a certain project uh, with a specific company. Since the project is already market driven and the company is already in the platform, it's easier, it would be easier for the financial institutions, you know, the rural banks, street banks and the cooperatives as well as the MFIs. Uh, to conduct their due diligence because all the stakeholders are in the same platform. And um, lastly, uh, for the LGUs and uh, you know the local government units and the agencies, I mean it will be a, a good chance for the LGUs, you know, the mayors and officials of a certain locality, to profile the farmers, and that you know see you know what what are the information i mean the agricultural based information in their municipality i mean it will help them uh in, in the policy making uh, decisions that they are going to do in their municipality and what kind of activities are they going to push for what kind of commodities should they go for so anyway um so essentially this will also maximize the use of resources so what we are uh, shifting into what we are developing now is a chain-wide collaborative platform uh, with all of these stakeholders. So to a certain extent, we are looking, you know, we are inviting all of you to be part of this platform in the future. I mean, you can actually even talk to us at this stage wherein we are uh, developing the platform and see if you have some good ideas on how we can improve on the design. So who are the new people under 
uh, agronegosyo, we gathered a team of experts uh, from different fields uh, that can actually contribute into having this, you know, designing and implementing this uh, chain-wide, you know, multi-stakeholder uh, platform. So we have here our, our original co-founder uh, of agronegosyo, uh, his Roy Taala. He used to be the country director of Accenture, and he's now a CIO in Ayala Automotive Business Services. Uh, Thelma is a certified public accountant uh, who has worked with the, um, who has been instrumental actually in turning around the operations of certain companies, especially in the real estate uh, sector. Uh, we have a lawyer on board. Uh, she is uh, Victoria Karangay. She's uh, in, uh, in, engaged right now with ideals. No? So she is um, focusing on uh, sustainable business practices and policies. She has, ha she has actually helped us in drafting the Inclusive Business Bill when I was still with BOI. And uh, they are hoping to file that bill in Congress soon, you know, uh, I suppose in the next couple of months. So, and then we have here Marcos Perez, uh, June Perez. Uh, he is a consultant for financial inclusion with uh, rural banks, thrift banks, and MFIs. So we also have Diane Arboleda, who's a social inclusion and gender expert. Then we have uh, Danilo Pedragosa, who's a, an m and uh, specialist, and uh, Grace Santos, who's affiliated right now with Ateneo de Manila and is the executive uh, director of UNID uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, given that, uh, that's the platform that we're actually working on right now. As you can see, you know, there's a massive shift from being an e-commerce platform to this multi-stakeholder platform. So if you see any value, you know, if you see yourself being a part of this platform, uh, feel free to contact us. So we have our email address here. And if you have questions later, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, share your questions on the Q&A section. So that's all. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, maraming salamat po, Ms. Mel, for, uh, for sharing with us your experience in agronegosyo and transforming it to become more um, inclusive. Okay, for your... Um, this session today is uh, quite different from the usual learning series that we have organized in PPSA. Uh, today, we invited a moderator to facilitate the moderated discussion and uh, read your questions and uh, comments for our speakers. Um, next slide, please. Um, Anton Simon Palo is a value chain expert, uh, a former consultant of GrowAsia for PPSA, and the general manager of Foodlink Advocacy Cooperative, or, or FAC. Um, it's a talent pool of agribusiness experts and practitioners with a common passion working towards poverty eradication and achieving inclusive and sustainable development for farm communities in the Philippines. With that, thank you so much, Anton, for having you here, and over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, VJ, for your uh, introduction. Uh, may I also request all our speakers to reveal their uh, pleasant faces, <laughs> just so that we can have uh, see your see your expressions as well uh, as you're explaining. Um, definitely, what I'm going to do first, uh, I'll, I'll try to abuse my position as moderator by asking two questions first, two questions of my own, and um, but. I can guarantee you, Jonah and Arnel, that uh, these questions might have uh, at least some indirect uh, hit uh, with regards to your questions already that you've posted. Uh, so my first question, so um, what we've heard so far is that uh, so a, a number of ideas with regards to how uh, impact uh, measurement, monitoring, and evaluation is actually done. Uh, from Lily, we're looking, we're seeing a application uh, through the theories of change and frameworks of projects and programs, and then we moved on to uh, scorecards and benchmarks from Lisa and Arian's discussion, uh, in, on 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 differing levels. So one is on a regional scale, one is more on a company scale, and then with Mel, it's uh, a repository, a kind of knowledge hub by which we can actually also utilize well one store and um, access and then analyze all these information so that we can have uh, very good um, business decisions, I suppose. Now, the 
my my first question um and my set of questions would be a little bit more on the pragmatic side just just like how jonah and arnel have posed the question um the first question would be the meaningful change especially in agribusiness seems to be a very long-term thing um and there's probably a reason why arian's uh, action plan is 10 years long because it seems like meaningful change happens uh in a period of eight to ten years and this is a very long thing now how do we now reconcile that with the performance indicators or performance measurements of specific implementing units uh, that are assessed evaluated on a sub-annual uh, scale so uh, anywhere some would even do monthly some quarterly semestral etc um, so and how do we now convince decision makers uh, let's say decision makers within companies or corporations, um, but also policy makers to do to to have this because, um, as you can see with Lily's discussion, uh, the more complex, the more complex your your framework, it seems like that's the more uh, increases the validity, the robustness of your framework. But at the same time, it's also making it more difficult to translate it into specific actions that most decision makers and policy makers look for all right so who wants to start <laughs> um may all right go, go lily i might just well start so that it makes it easier for me <laughs> um no so so what you're talking about here uh anton is understanding what is the process of change if we know how change can take place then we have a better way of actually identifying what we need to do to make that long-term change. So, and the and, and, uh, premise behind that is knowing what our goal is. What is the change, that 10-year meaningful change that you want to see? The problem is, and I am guilty of this myself, sometimes we do things just because we want to see an outcome rather quickly, but we don't try to think of what that long-term change could be. And we cannot afford to actually do that for every single thing we do. For example, if you have a two month project and you try to do that long term change thinking, it might actually be, you know, over overthinking what you need to do. So you need to be realistic about what resources you have, what is the long term change you want to see, and where do you sit in that equation. So that's why I always talk about what is your role, clarifying what your role is, and what you can do, and who do you need to work with in order to achieve the vision that you have. That is essentially what the theory of change is. So if you talk to uh, academics or social entrepreneurs or, or people who are um, thinking about this from a, almost a philosophical perspective, but it's really not philosophical. It's, it's talking about what are the theories or assumptions you have around that change and therefore what can you do along the way? So your performance indicators that you actually focus on, those are the things you watch out for on a three monthly basis or a monthly basis even, but add them up, they will contribute to that meaningful change that you want to see if you have planned it out. All right, All right thank you. Um, we have two speakers here who have a very, uh, very unique positions. Well, um, very good positions to answer the question, both on a, policy and on a, a corporate level, I suppose, or business level. Um, Lisa and Mel have actually done both sides of discussing with businesses, but at the same time also doing policy making decision uh, discussions. Uh, perhaps we can hear from Lisa first. Yeah, so thank you, um, Anton. Um, well, I think um, when development interventions are done, there's usually what is called a logical framework. Yeah? And the logical framework is composed of a hierarchy of objectives, yeah? And you talk about what inputs are needed, what outputs uh, result from inputs, given that you go through these processes, and given the outputs that are actually implemented over time, what are the outcomes yeah? that are stakeholder-based, right? And so, in, in a manner of speaking, you will need to actually have a logical framework for any intervention that is long-term. And I guess uh, the beauty, <laughs> and let me plug, the beauty of our benchmarks for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment in agricultural value chains is that it actually mixes inputs, outputs, uh, processes, and outcomes 
uh, so that you're act you actually have one tool that tries to actually, uh, you know, uh, one tool that you can use over time to improve your practice and outcomes. Um, so I guess um, that's why we also created the scorecard that way because uh, that question that you asked is actually a very complicated thing to, um, thing to answer if it is not in one tool, yeah? So um, in that sense, for example, in, um, in the, lev on the level of outcomes, these are in the, in the scorecard that we, I explained earlier, no? we had three elements. At the, fo the fourth element is about outcomes. But the first three elements are about inputs, outputs, and processes. Yeah? So in that, ma in that way, we're able to combine the needed interventions and outcomes that are required for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment to really happen in agricultural value chains. Yeah? Uh, on the question of how do we convince policymakers and decision makers, the benchmarks are for practitioners, right? Uh, so we decided that it's also important for us to influence policymakers and uh, decision makers in government um, so that they can actually provide incentives and support programs that would, uh, you know, promote the practice of the benchmarks by corporations, by SMEs, by social enterprises. And that is the process that we're going through now. We are doing, a, we are developing a policy paper that we will be submitting to ASEAN uh, and to department, the Department of Agriculture, for example, in the Philippines, uh, in order for us to uh, uh, work with government to actually promote the benchmarks, yeah? But also we have, uh, we have already um, launched a multi-stakeholder platform that we call We Live Food, Women's Empowerment, Livelihood, and Food in Agricultural Value Chains. It is actually a, a platform, a multi-stakeholder platform for uh, inclusive recovery and building back fairer no? in agricultural value chains. And here we're hoping that we can bring together all actors so that the practice of the benchmarks and the incentives to practice the benchmarks can be actually unified, it can be put in a unified process. So that's, I think, the way that we see it. All right, thanks, Lisa. About you, Mel, uh, having done the IBV bill, uh, <laughs> the, that process. Yes, actually, it's, it's quite tough on the policy side, no? Um, when you think about it, I mean, for example, the Philippines has been quite pioneering on so many uh, activities when it comes to inclusive business. Uh, Incentives-wise, I mean, it's there. Um, however, the problem is, other than the incentives, what exactly are the other support services that the government gives to the IB projects that are being developed? Um, it's it's very uh, difficult to re really get all the of the stakeholders on board. Um, I mean, just on the government side alone. I mean, it's there's kind of still of the turfing that you know BOI has its own you know idea on how to implement inclusive business. The, the DA has its own idea. You know, DTI, which is even the mother organization of BOI, uh, has also a different approach. And I um, mean, how do you get all of these uh, actors to talk? So when, when we did that, uh, we designed an inclusive business roadmap wherein we kind of placed on paper, you know, what's in it for you as an agency, what's in it for you as a company, what's in it for you as a community and, and, and such. Um, but then, I mean, when, when I left the agency, so that, that there, again, remains to be seen, are they going really to do something with the roadmap? So, um, so th this is why we thought that, you know, uh, through this platform, we can sort of, to a certain extent, start the oper operationalization of that roadmap and start with the basics, you know, what's, uh, how, uh, where are the communities, where are the companies, you know, that, that's the usual problem. I mean, an investor goes into the country, you know, looks, uh, will say that, okay, I want to establish a power, a manufacturing plant, where are the, uh, the farmers? There's no data on board. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, there's an actual project that we have had wherein you have to go from town to town, you know, talking to the municipal agricultural officer, you know, just to get data. And yet at the end of, uh, you know, a week, a month, you're still short. 
I mean, the company needs, for example, 10,000 hectares. How much did you, were you able to, you know, come up with 4,000 hectares? So uh, uh, you're, you're losing investments just because of that. I mean, and this is also something that the platform also envisions that, you know, in the end, if we can, you know, if we can work together to profile the farmers, then the platform can also serve as an investor's hub which actually is a need, not just in the Philippines, but, all, but also in other countries. So um, this is what we are trying to do here, even in the uh, interaction between the com community and the company who actually tracks you know, uh, data down to the farmer level. I mean, would companies really say that, okay, if Nestle says, I am engaging 10,000 farmers for my coffee project, I mean, how much exactly are those uh, farmers earning? You know, have they improved over the years? So that's what actually what we are trying to offer here. That let's work with the baseline. You know, next year perhaps the co-op can do another you know a, a assessment and see if there's an improvement. So it goes. Um, we can plot it. You know, year after year, and eventually we have a significant data that we can use. And in the same manner, if a company, for example, engages with 100 farmers for a certain project, and we can see through the platform that 10 farmers did not improve their income, did not improve their yield. I mean, so we can create targeted interventions to address the issue on those 10 farmers. So there, there's a lot of potential here. I mean, um, of course, when you are saying that, you know, meaningful change eight to 10 years, well, that's probably true. But I mean, if we start now, we start documenting, then we can create targeted interventions and hopefully we can shorten the process. So what we are trying to say is that let's get everyone on board, let's talk, and uh, let's put the concerns of you know the, the relevant stakeholders into the platform and see if we can actually uh, accelerate you know the changes that they you want to see. So I hope right. that answers answers your question. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in which case, um, so we we've heard the the, the responses from. Uh, business level to a country level how about on a regional level erin um of course now we see that it's complicated down here how do we now deal with th uh, deal with things up there yeah thanks so much anton and i think this also links well to arnello's question about the kind of critique of policies coming out of asean that they don't have teeth um, and that it would be hard to get ASEAN member states to take up things that we see coming out of the Secretariat. So we are right now struggling with a, a kind of interesting question of the chicken and egg issue, where we know that we need to see ASEAN member states adopting policies that reflect those 10 thematic areas um, of the ASEAN RAI, but, but of many, many, many different standards that already exist. But the policymakers are also saying to us, well, show us that private sector is demanding this kind of thing, and then we'll embed it into policy. So we're faced with this kind of which has to come first. And to Melanie's point, I think it's that we do have to create a baseline, and that's what we're doing, of in ASEAN, a baseline of existing investment and set up a system whereby we could understand the kind of responsible practices that those companies are taking. So that's why we're doing case studies. That's why we're going to have a consultant come in and, and do this um, assessment of investments across ASEAN so that every couple of years we can measure against those baselines and see how we're moving forward. But that's quantitative data. It takes a long time. So the other thing I'll say is that what we're seeing a lot of success in is when we can have these small wins, when we have a private sector partner or even a bank coming to a consultation workshop and telling policymakers directly, this is what matters to us, this is important. And even if that's only two to three, say, companies that are saying that to a policymaker, those anecdotal and, and kind of qualitative uh, responses do end up influencing the decisions that we see policymakers making, certainly at the national level, um, but we also see it happening at the regional level. That's the ASEAN RAI were created with 250 comments from private sector, CSOs, NGOs, farmer groups, and the ASEAN Secretariat was very interested in getting all of those perspectives. So I think we also have to use these opportunities for small wins where we're bringing in stories, uh, whether it be from case studies or, or companies themselves. And in that way, I think we'll start to see the push that needs to happen on both sides, both of the private sector and public sector. All right. Um, so it actually sounds like you're saying 
we need we also need to market our our tools and uh, scorecards just so that we can actually achieve buy-in uh, from these policy makers and uh, decision makers um, in which case Erin um, in connection to Arnel's question about uh, having you know these tools not having enough teeth uh, the so in, in, in that sense, um, the, the, the suggestion there is uh, when it's actually being uh, fed into a regulatory process, uh, the, the, the usage of these tools and um, the use of indicators in general become more, uh, the, the, the compliance increases. Uh, I would also like to look at the other side, which is essentially what, how do you incentivize? Um, so for example, and this is actually my question, <laughs> Uh, many of the agribusiness heads of certain companies um, have mentioned to me in confidence that uh, they find these scorecards, indicators, monitoring, evaluation tools as a kind of chore. Um, they, 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 they see the, the effort of having to implement it and, and they realize that and they're, they're aware of the fact that, well, yes, uh, when these scorecards are used, it, it at, at the very least uh, adds on to their brand making, uh, brand building. Um, but on the day-to-day -day operations level, it seems like uh, an added level of effort with, which does not actually give them, well, at least according to them, uh, any kind of useful uh, information. Uh, let, let's say maybe I, uh, I, in, in, if we compare it to, let's say, the usual indicators of efficiency, cost-benefit analysis, um, like that. So how do we now, uh, or... I would like to ask the speakers, uh, what are your responses to this kind of sentiment? Uh, let's start with Erin this time. Thanks, Anton. And that's why I, every time I'm talking about the ASEAN guidelines, I put that slide that says, what are the incentives to participate anyway? Because I hear from every agribusiness partner that I approach, well, why should I do this? Um, and so we have, I think there's really three strong arguments for why private sector, especially, in particular agribusiness, because that's what we're talking about today, should look at, say, the, the benchmarks that Ms. Lisa has put forward or the ASEAN RAG guidelines. One of them is understanding the relevance to market. So when we can show that products, that, that there's a market, say, from the EU or even ideally in other parts of Asia for sustainably produced products and that those products have to be able to be traceable along the supply chain, including during any investment processes, that's where we start to see some real change when the customers are demanding it. And when I say customers, I mean major retailers out of the EU. And we are seeing that shift. The sustainable rice platform has a couple of retailers from the EU that have already said that they will stock sustainably produced rice. And they're working together to make sure that that demand is strong enough to support smallholder farmers taking up sustainable certification practices. So I, I see that as a win. Um, there's also fantastic resources online like the International Trade Center that actually show market demand for very specific agricultural products and where that demand exists. And then if the demand is higher, if a company has chosen to certify their practices or to follow a set of responsible practices. So those things absolutely make a difference. The second thing is access to sustainable financing. If you can have a lower interest rate on your loan from X bank because you're hitting sustainability KPIs, that's very attractive. And we are slowly seeing an increase there, but it's slow. Um, and then the last piece is that access to learning and sharing best practices from a network. Uh, Ms. Lisa referred to this as well did Mel with platforms. People want to be able to learn from each other and understand where did you find market demand for that product? Why was it important for you, Agribusiness A in Cambodia, to take up these practices and how did that impact your bottom line? Um, so I think it, it does really have to come back to market demand and opportunities for growth for the companies. All right. Thanks, Irene. Uh, we'll, we'll do it in reverse. So Mel this time. Hello. Uh, can, can can you repeat the question, Pan? <laughs> so oh, essentially, no, um, many of these operations heads of uh, companies uh, find that the usage of benchmarks, tools, indicators, and I assume, for example, having done um, inclusive business indicators, uh, talking with them, um, they find it as a chore 
um, but rather than actually being able to contribute useful information to their uh, activities. Uh, apologies for the work that's happening behind me. Um, how how do you how how would you respond to that sentiment? Well, actually, that's that's uh, really true to a certain extent, right? Uh, which is why uh, we are actually thinking of, I mean, which is why this platform is also being developed. I mean, it's really to help also the companies, you know, lessen the workload on the company side. I mean, with the engagement that they are having the communities, I mean, the platform can do the tracking for them, can do the monitoring for them. I mean, it's it's basically, you know, making things easier for them. Um, I can't really say that, you know, that's untrue because to a certain extent that's true. I mean, um, because even even when we were promoting inclusive business, I mean, when we were talking at the ASEAN APEC level, you know, other countries are, are telling us in the Philippines that, you know, you're giving incentives just because the government wants to pass on to the private sector its role, you know, of, of alleviating people out of poverty. And um, we said that, well, you know, it's not really, you know, passing on the burden to the private sector, but rather the incentives are being meant to share the risks. You know? um, so it's something along those lines. So it's sharing the risks. It's uh, lessening the burden. So what can we do to, do to to lessen that and get the private sector on board? So we have to find solutions. You know, we have to design something to to really kind of uh, tell them that you know that other other workload that you are talking about that can be addressed if you use this platform. You know, something like that. So. All right. Uh, thanks, Mel, um, Lisa, and this seems to be. Um, a direct relevant has direct relevance to you, especially yeah. since, yeah, yeah go ahead. but I think, um, you see, some tools uh, are actually advocacy tools, right? And I think those tools are you know, you, you, you measure impact so that you can show that you're a responsible business, right? But actually, the benchmarks, for example, a uh, scorecard that we created is not just an advocacy tool. It's actually an evaluation, planning, and learning tool. So for example, the scorecard can actually show each company if you're wanting to invest in 15 areas uh, so that you can be an enabler of women's economic empowerment in your agricultural value chain, what are those 15 areas? The, I mean, the, the benchmarks will actually tell you that. No? It's in benchmark three and uh, also in other areas in the other, uh, in one, two, and four also, but uh, concentrated in benchmark three. No? So um, in that sense, uh, I guess it depends on the, the nature of the benchmark or the tool, right? Uh, so the, the tool that we have developed is an evaluation, planning, and learning tool so that it is directly useful for the company to improve their policy and practice, right? And uh, so in that context, I think it tries to respond to the weakness uh, that you're talking about. And I think the reason why we came up with this kind of benchmark scorecard tool that is for evaluation, learning, and planning is because we precisely heard this as a lament of companies, right? Both SMEs and corporations. So we, we, uh, we, we actually tried to do a tool to develop uh, a tool that is not like that. And that's what we have the benchmarks for. So I hope uh, that some companies can actually uh, be brave souls to pilot the tools with us uh, because that's actually the stage where we're in. We develop the, the, the benchmarks in 20, uh, up to 2017. From 2017 to now, we've been developing the scorecards. Yeah. And now we're in the process of piloting the scorecards with companies, with actual companies. And uh, there are actually takers from both. Um, I think um, in the last um, in the last discussion, for example, among the Philippine Business for Social Progress members, Harvest, which is actually a big agricultural uh, agribusiness company, was really very interested in working with us to, uh, to, to implement the benchmarks, to use the benchmarks in their own company. So we hope to get more, more uh, buy-ins. And then uh, we're, providing the, we're providing the services at the moment for the use of the tools, of course, for free, no? because they are pilot, it's at the pilot stage. So maybe we will be marketing them as regular services at a much later stage. 
when there's already proof of practice, yeah, uh, the proof of uh, the, of its usefulness, relevance, and uh, validity as a tool for evaluation, learning, and planning among companies. All right. Uh, let me emphasize that it's free at the moment. So while it's free, go get your <laughs> your your evaluation um, uh, free services for benchmarking. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be a VIP access of sorts. <laughs> All right. Uh, on to Lily. And um, I, I know that it's not just about programs and projects for you. You also con uh, do consultancies with companies. So how do you make uh, these theories of change frameworks relevant to them, uh, especially the operations people. <laughs> Mickey. Oh, uh, look, we, we don't, well, one thing I do is I don't push tools. I, I make them, I, absolutely. I have uh, several tools already, um, but we co-design tools because the best way to actually get uh, people to adopt something is when they own it. Um, so the thing with that is you also can't tailor every single thing, but you have the core principles that you take along with you, and then the people co-design that with you, and then they take it on. We try to embed them in existing processes. So for example, I've had many conversations with accountants. Accountants are our internal reporting systems for our businesses, right? So if the accountants have to say something and report something, you know, it, it normally gets accepted because it's the end, end point. Uh, it's where accountability happens within the organization. So that's one pathway that we take is to take it through the accountancy um, domain. Uh, other ways is through embedded through the day-to-day -day decision making of the different managers who are actually there. And you have to take into account what types of decisions they make on a day-to-day -day basis and how can you actually be part of that. So a problem is never taken on its own and never faced on its own by a company. It's actually in the context of a broader space. So if you take into to take inclusion as part of that broader space and embed it that way, tools just become part of the day to day. Um, that's the main thing. When it comes to the assessments that I talk about and the theory of change, I have to be honest, it's not for everyone. Nobody, not everyone has to do a theory of change and not everyone has to do an integrated assessment. There are levels at which these things work best. And I would say that maybe you can use them at a board level on a, an annual or, or every five year review when you're doing your big strategic planning. Um, you don't use it on a daily basis for the operations people who are running the plant. You know, that, not, not that kind of thing. So it's horses for courses. Um, and, and but making sure that you understand the need and the types of decisions that need to be made before you actually suggest tools. All right. So it seems like uh, even with tools, we have um, the off the shelf type uh, varieties and we also have the more bespoke ones. And I suppose we can also figure out um, the, the kinds of costs and uh, levels of effort that will be uh, accompanying those kinds of services. Uh, I would like to ask um, one of the participants, uh, Mr. Eric Manalang, to, uh, he has a comment uh, with regards to the presentations. Um, uh, Mr. Eric Manalang is actually a, uh, a board member of uh, Foodlink Advocacy Cooperative, but at the same time, he's the chair of uh, Experts Packaging uh, Corporation. Uh, if I, correct me if, if, if I got it this right, sir, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, sir, but um, he, you, you also headed uh, Pepsi Philippines at some point. So, Sir Eric. Hi, Anton. Hi, everybody. Um, what did you want to ask, Anton? <laughs> so, uh, essentially, you mentioned that um, you were in, in your comments, uh, you were talking about uh, to simplify the framework. Um, yeah. Being a person uh, at the decision-making uh, position, uh, perhaps also having gone through operations, yeah. um, could, could you give us a, a sense of your sentiments? Well, I, uh, I actually uh, really appreciated the presentations. And however, having been at the board level and at the operating level, uh, I could see that there could be easily a disconnect and uh, it might uh, it might seem that the uh, academic part may be a little bit too emphasized to the point where in people that would be listening to it and uh, I don't mean this in a negative way 
it's probably dependent on that person who is or that stakeholder. But I'm trying to imagine this, Anton, when we go down to the uh, farmer level or the cooperative level, wherein we have to talk about uh, what really will be the deliverables. And uh, of course, scorecards are important. Uh, goals are important, but we have to also appreciate that they may not have this complex thinking in mind, but they do have problems. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, thank you for that, sir. Um, very heavy insight. Um, any comments or responses <laughs> from our panelists? All right. <laughs> um, Lily, you unmuted yourself. Uh, just so. a really short way, I, the, assuming that the other panelists were not um, going to respond. Um, it's, it's true uh, that we don't overbear the people that we are meant to help. Uh, and that's one of the, 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 the things we had to embed as part of an engagement pre principles in the work that we do. This, the quest to actually understand what the problems are can end up being burdensome if we are not careful in how we seek information and how we source information. So we do that with everyone. We do it with the communities and the farmers that we work with. We do it with the businesses that we work with. We do it with the government and entities that we work with. We do not want to be burdensome in the quest to understand more. Um, what we want to do is to be helpful. So uh, that's a really important point to push. And thank you, Sir Eric, for, for pointing that out because we do not serve our purpose if we actually create more problems for the people we seek to help. Maybe a, just a short intervention also. Sure, well, sure. Um, I think um, we, we were able to do uh, an action research that was based on practice no? because I think the benchmarks were actually based on best practices of actual social enterprises and inclusive businesses that have um, proven to have an impact on women and men small scale producers, right? So it's a bottom-up approach that we actually did in terms of an action research to create the benchmarks. And the perspective that is taken by the benchmark is precisely uh, from the perspective of women and men small-scale producers. No? But the reason why we also created a scorecard that is different for corporations, a different scorecard for SMEs, yeah? a different scorecard for agricultural value chain interventions. We don't have a scorecard for farmers and women and men farmers, right? Uh, because the, the, you know, the entities that we're wanting to actually influence are um, companies and SMEs and corporations. So the, the corporate scorecard was made very carefully after we conducted uh, key informant interviews as well as uh, roundtable discussions with companies uh, on what kind of scorecard will work for them. Yeah, uh, because we did come out with uh, with uh, the synthesis of our research. No? Uh, I think was kind of uh, in a manner of speaking. Uh, academic in that sense because it tried to synthesize uh, the insights from best practices, right? But when we already transformed them into scorecards, I think that was an effort to uh, to be useful uh, for the research results to be useful to practitioners and uh, the practitioners that are that may be corporations, that may be SMEs, social enterprises, or agricultural value chain players. And that's the reason also why we are creating a different set of guidelines for transformational partnerships and women's economic empowerment for, for, in agricultural value chains for governments, yeah, because uh, they know, you know, they also speak a different language. They also play a different role, right? So we've we've strived to do that. Uh, hopefully, we have uh, succeeded a bit in becoming more relevant. Thanks. All right. All right. Um, it's around it's at 4 p.m already um i'll just try to wrap up this quickly um what we hear or what we've heard so far is that definitely measuring your performance your your um your current um social standing uh all these indicators benchmarks etc uh your um how you're moving towards your long-term goals these are all important um what we're going to now to uh, have to emphasize right now is that uh 
how you're going to do this is also based on who you're working with. So it's not just an understanding of, uh, of the problems or issues, of, you know, the, the variables, the factors, but also the relationships that you have with your stakeholders. And that will now dictate whether it's actually a benchmark tool, a scorecard tool, and a regional level, a more simple, simple way, uh, a theory of change. Um, it, it also, it will have to be, uh, so essentially there's no silver bullet. Uh, even for this, uh, which is which seems to be a very uh, agriculture issue kind of theme, right? Um, there is no silver bullet. Uh, we're just gonna have to keep on uh, trying to understand each and every one of these things as we go. All right. Um, so, who am I returning the ball to? Uh, is it Ami, VJ, or Pranav? <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank yeah, you, VJ. Yeah. All right. Um... Uh, thank you so much to our speakers, um, Lily, Lisa, Erin, and Mel, for your uh, valuable insights. Uh, of course, your, for sharing your tools and benchmarks. Um, I hope we uh, stay in touch and continue our discussions and, well, hopefully collaborations in the future. Of course, thank you so much as well, Anton, for uh, moderating the discussion today. Um, also, we would like to thank our participants for their for their questions and uh, participation today. Um, lastly, before we uh, close the, the session, next slide, please. Okay, uh, we would like to invite you to the two remaining webinars of this PPSA Working Groups Learning Series. The next topic is on agricultural financing. Uh, you may register in advance by scanning the QR code, but uh, Please anticipate the release of further webinar announcements for this session. Again, thank you very much to everyone, for, to our speakers and Anton, to, uh, to our participants. And we hope to see you all in our next webinar. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you. Po. Thank you. Thank you.